Section 1 of Chapter 20 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 20. Section 1. It is now time to relate the events which, since the Battle of La Hague, had taken place at Saint Germain. James, after seeing the fleet which was to have convoyed him back to his kingdom burned down to the water edge, had returned in no good humour to his abode near Paris. Misfortune generally made him devout after his own fashion, and he now starved himself and flogged himself till his spiritual guides were forced to interfere. It is difficult to conceive a duller place than Saint-Germain was when he held his court there, and yet there was scarcely in all Europe a residence more enviably situated than that which the generous Louis had assigned to his suppliants. The woods were magnificent, the air clear and salubrious, the prospects extensive and cheerful. No charm of rural life was wanting, and the towers of the most superb city of the continent were visible in the distance. The royal apartments were richly adorned with tapestry and marquetry, vases of silver and mirrors in gilded frames. A pension of more than forty thousand pounds sterling was annually paid to James from the French treasury. He had a guard of honor composed of some of the finest soldiers in Europe. If he wished to amuse himself with field sports, he had at his command an establishment far more sumptuous than that which had belonged to him when he was at the head of a great kingdom, an army of huntsmen and fowlers, a vast arsenal of guns, spears, bugle-horns, and tents, miles of network, staghounds, foxhounds, harriers, packs of boar and packs of wolf, jer falcons for the heron and haggard for the wild duck. His presence chamber and his antechamber were in outward show as splendid as when he was at Whitehall. He was still surrounded by blue ribbons and white staves. But over the mansion and the domain brooded a constant gloom, the effect partly of bitter regrets and of deferred hopes, but chiefly of the abject superstition which had taken complete possession of his own mind and which was affected by almost all those who aspired to his favor. His palace wore the aspect of a monastery. There were three places of worship within the spacious pile. Thirty or forty ecclesiastics were lodged in the building, and their apartments were eyed with envy by noblemen and gentlemen who had followed the fortunes of their sovereign, and who had thought it hard that, when there was so much room under his roof, they should be forced to sleep in the garrets of the neighboring town. Among the murmurers was the brilliant Anthony Hamilton. He has left us a sketch of the life of Saint-Germain, a slight sketch indeed, but not unworthy to the artist to whom we owe the most highly finished and vividly colored picture of the English court in the days when the English court was gayest. He complains that existence was one round of religious exercises, that in order to live in peace it was necessary to pass half the day in devotion or in an outward show of devotion, that if he tried to dissipate his melancholy by breathing the fresh air of that noble terrace which looks down the valley of the Seine, he was driven away by the clamor of a Jesuit who had got hold of some unfortunate Protestant royalists from England and was proving to them that no heretic could go to heaven. In general, Hamilton said, men suffering under a common calamity have a strong fellow feeling and are disposed to render good offices to each other. But it was not so at Saint-Germain. There all was discord, jealousy, bitterness of spirit. Malignity was concealed under the show of friendship and of piety. All the saints of the royal household were praying for each other and backbiting each other from morning to night. Here and there in the throng of hypocrites might be remarked a man too high-spirited to dissemble but such a man however advantageously he might have made himself known elsewhere was certain to be treated with disdain by the inmates of that sullen abode such was the court of james as described by a roman catholic yet however disagreeable that court may have been to a roman catholic it was infinitely more disagreeable to a protestant 
for the protestant had to endure in addition to all the dullness of which the roman catholic complained a crowd of vexations from which the roman catholic was free in every competition between a protestant and a roman catholic the roman catholic was preferred in every quarrel between a protestant and a roman catholic the roman catholic was supposed to be in the right while the ambitious protestant looked in vain for promotion while the dissipated protestant looked in vain for amusement the serious protestant looked in vain for spiritual instruction and consolation james might no doubt easily have obtained permission for those members of the church of england who had sacrificed everything in his cause to meet privately in some modest oratory and to receive the eucharistic bread and wine from the hands of one of their own clergy but he did not wish his residence to be defiled by such impious rites dr dennis granville who had quitted the richest deanery the richest archdeanery and one of the richest livings in england rather than take the oaths gave mortal offence by asking leave to read prayers to the exiles in his own communion his request was refused and he was so grossly insulted by his master's chaplains and their retainers that he was forced to quit saint germain lest some other anglican doctor should be equally importunate james wrote to inform his agents in england that he wished no protestant divine to come out to him indeed the non-juring clergy were at least as much sneered at and as much railed at at his palace as in his nephew's if any man had a claim to be mentioned with respect at saint germain it was surely sancroft yet it was reported that bigots who were assembled there never spoke of him but with aversion and disgust the sacrifice of the first place in the church of the first place in the peerage of the mansion at lambeth and the mansion at croydon of immense patronage and of a revenue of more than five thousand a year was thought but a poor atonement for the great crime of having modestly remonstrated against the unconstitutional declaration of indulgence sancroft was pronounced to be just such a traitor and just such a penitent as judas iscariot the old hypocrite had it was said while affecting reverence and love for his master given the fatal signal to his master's enemies when the mischief had been done and could not be repaired the conscience of the sinner had begun to torture him he had like his prototype blamed himself and bemoaned himself he had like his prototype flung down his wealth at the feet of those whose instrument he had been the best thing that he could now do was to make the parallel complete by hanging himself james seemed to have thought that the strongest proof of kindness which he could give to heretics who had resigned wealth country family for his sake was to suffer them to be beset on their dying beds by his priests if some sick man helpless in body and in mind and deafened by the din of bad logic and bad rhetoric suffered a wafer to be thrust into his mouth a great work of grace was triumphantly announced to the court and the neophyte was buried with all the pomp of religion but if a royalist of the highest rank and most stainless character died professing firm attachment to the church of england a hole was dug in the fields and at the dead of night he was flung into it and covered up like a mass of carrion such were the obsequies of the earl of dunfermline who had served the house of stuart with the hazard of his life and to the utter ruin of his fortunes who had fought at killiecrankie and who had after the victory lifted from the earth the still breathing remains of dundee while living he had been treated with contumely the scottish officers who had long served under him had in vain entreated that when they were formed into a company he might still be their commander his religion had been thought a fatal disqualification a worthless adventurer whose only recommendation was that he was a papist was preferred dunfermline continued during a short time to make his appearance in the circle which surrounded the prince whom he had served too well but it was to no purpose the bigots who ruled the court refused to the ruined and expatriated protestant lord the means of subsistence he died of a broken heart and they refused him even a grave the insults daily offered at saint germain to the protestant religion produced a great effect in england the whigs triumphantly asked whether it were not clear that the old tyrant was utterly incorrigible 
and many even of the non-jurors observed his proceedings with shame disgust and alarm the jacobite party had from the first been divided into two sections which three or four years after the revolution began to be known as the compounders and the non-compounders the compounders were those who wished for a restoration but for a restoration accompanied by a general amnesty and by guarantees for the security of the civil and ecclesiastical constitution of the realm the non-compounders thought it downright whiggery downright rebellion to take advantage of his majesty's unfortunate situation for the purpose of imposing on him any condition the plain duty of his subjects was to bring him back what traitors he would punish what traitors he would spare what laws he would observe and with what laws he would dispense were questions to be decided by himself alone if he decided them wrongly he must answer for his fault to heaven and not to his people the great body of english jacobites were more or less compounders the pure non-compounders were chiefly to be found among the roman catholics who very naturally were not solicitous to obtain any security for a religion which they thought heretical or for a polity from the benefit of which they were excluded there were also some protestant non-jurors such as kettlewell and hicks who resolutely followed the theory of filmer to all the extreme consequences to which it led but though kettlewell tried to convince his countrymen that monarchical government had been ordained by god not as a means of making them happy here but as a cross which it was their duty to take up and bear in the hope of being recompensed for their sufferings hereafter and though hicks assured them that there was not a single compounder in the whole Thebian legion, very few churchmen were inclined to run the risk of the gallows merely for the purpose of re-establishing the high commission and the dispensing power. The compounders formed the main strength of the Jacobite party in England, but the non-compounders had hitherto had undivided sway at Saint-Germain. No Protestant, no moderate Roman Catholic, no man who dared hint that any law could bind the royal prerogative could hope for the smallest mark of favor from the banished king the priest and the apostate melfort the avowed enemy of the protestant religion and of civil liberty of parliament and of trial by jury and of the habeas corpus act were in exclusive possession of the royal ear herbert was called chancellor walked before the other officers of the state wore a black robe embroidered with gold and carried a seal but he was a member of the church of england and therefore he was not suffered to sit at the council board the truth is that the faults of james head and heart were incurable in his view there could be between him and his subjects no reciprocity of obligation their duty was to risk property liberty life in order to replace him on the throne and then to bear patiently whatever he chose to inflict upon them they could no more pretend to merit before him than before god when they had done all they were still unprofitable servants the highest praise due to the royalist who shed his blood on the field of battle or on the scaffold for hereditary monarchy was simply that he was not a traitor after all the severe discipline which the deposed king had undergone he was still as much bent on plundering and abasing the church of england as on the day when he told the kneeling fellows of maudlin to get out of his sight or on the day when he sent the bishops to the tower he was in the habit of declaring that he would rather die without seeing england again than stooped to capitulate with those whom he ought to command in the declaration of april sixteen ninety two the whole man appears without disguise full of his own imaginary rights unable to understand how any body but himself can have any rights dull obstinate and cruel another paper which he drew up about the same time shows if possible still more clearly how little he had profited by a sharp experience in that paper he set forth the plan according to which he intended to govern when he should be restored he laid it down as a rule that one commissioner of the treasury one of the two secretaries of state the secretary of war the majority of the great officers of the household the majority of the lords of the bedchamber the majority of the officers of the army should always be roman catholics 
It was to no purpose that the most eminent compounders sent from London letter after letter filled with judicious counsel and earnest supplication. It was to no purpose that they demonstrated in the plainest manner the impossibility of establishing popish ascendancy in a country where at least forty-nine fiftieths of the population, and much more than forty-nine fiftieths of the wealth and the intelligent, were Protestant. It was to no purpose that they informed their master that the declaration of April 1692 had been read with exultation by his enemies and with deep affliction by his friends, that it had been printed and circulated by the usurpers, that it had done more than all the libels of the Whigs to inflame the nation against him, and that it had furnished those naval officers who had promised to support him with a plausible pretext for breaking faith with him and for destroying the fleet which was to have convoyed him back to his kingdom. He continued to be deaf to the remonstrances of his best friends in England till those remonstrances began to be echoed at Versailles. All that information which Lewis and his ministers were able to obtain touching the state of our island satisfied them that James would never be restored unless he could bring himself to make large concessions to his subjects. It was therefore intimated to him, kindly and courteously, but seriously, that he would do well to change his counsels and his counsellors. France could not continue the war for the purpose of forcing a sovereign on an unwilling nation. She was crushed by public burdens, her trade and industry languished, her harvest and her vintage had failed, the peasantry were starving, the faint murmurs of the provincial estates began to be heard. There was a limit to the amount of the sacrifices which the most absolute prince could demand from those whom he ruled. However desirous the most Christian king might be to uphold the cause of hereditary monarchy and of pure religion all over the world, his first duty was to his own kingdom, and, unless a counter-revolution speedily took place in England, his duty to his own kingdom might impose on him the painful necessity of treating with the Prince of Orange. It would therefore be wise in James to do without delay whatever he could honorably and conscientiously do to win back the hearts of his people. Thus pressed, James unwillingly yielded. He consented to give a share in the management of his affairs to one of the most distinguished of the compounders, Charles, Earl of Middleton. Middleton's family and his peerage were Scotch, but he was closely connected with some of the noblest houses of England. He had resided long in England, and he had been appointed by Charles the Second one of the English secretaries of state, and had been entrusted by James with the lead of the English House of Commons. His abilities and acquirements were considerable. His temper was easy and generous. His manners were popular, and his conduct had generally been consistent and honorable. He had, when Popery was in the ascendant, resolutely refused to purchase the royal favor by apostasy. Roman Catholic ecclesiastics had been sent to convert him, and the town had been much amused by the dexterity which which the layman baffled the divines. A priest undertook to demonstrate the doctrine of transubstantiation, and made the approaches in the usual form. Your lordship believes in the Trinity. Who told you so, said Middleton. Not believe in the Trinity, cried the priest in amazement. Nay, said Middleton, prove your religion to be true if you can, but do not catechize me about mine. As it was plain that the secretary was not a disputant whom it was easy to take at an advantage, the controversy ended almost as soon as it had begun. When fortune changed, Middleton adhered to the cause of hereditary monarchy with a steadfastness which was the more respectable because he would have had no difficulty in making his peace with the new government. His sentiments were so well known that, when the kingdom was agitated by apprehensions of an invasion and an insurrection, he was arrested and sent to the tower, but no evidence on which he could be convicted of treason was discovered, and when the dangerous crisis was passed, he was set at liberty. It should seem indeed that, during the three years which followed the revolution, he was by no means an active plotter. He saw that a restoration could be effected only with the general assent of the nation, and that the nation would never assent to a restoration without securities against popery and arbitrary power. 
He therefore conceived that, while his banished master obstinately refused to give such securities, it would be worse than idle to conspire against the existing government. Such was the man whom James, in consequence of strong representations from Versailles, now invited to join him in France. The great body of compounders learned with delight that they were at length to be represented in the council at Saint-Germain by one of their favorite leaders. Some noblemen and gentlemen, who, though they had not approved of the deposition of James, had been so much disgusted by his perverse and absurd conduct that they had long avoided all connection with him, now began to hope that he had seen his error. They had refused to have anything to do with Melfort, but they communicated freely with Middleton. The new minister conferred also with the four traitors whose infamy had been made preeminently conspicuous by their station, their abilities, and their great public services. With Godolphin, the great object of whose life was to be in favor with both the rival kings at once, and to keep, through all revolutions and counter-revolutions, his head, his estate, and a place at the board of treasury. With Shrewsbury, who, having once in a fatal moment entangled himself in criminal and dishonorable engagements, had not had the resolution to break through them, with Marlborough, who continued to profess the deepest repentance for the past and the best intentions for the future, and with Russell, who declared that he was still what he had been the day before La Hague, and renewed his promises to do what Monk had done, on condition that a general pardon should be granted to all political offenders, and that the royal power should be placed under strong constitutional restraints. End of section 1 Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Two of Chapter Twenty of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sharon Chimeradan. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 20, Section 2 Before Middleton left England, he had collected the sense of all the leading compounders. They were of the opinion that there was one expedient which would reconcile contending factions at home, and lead to the speedy pacification of Europe. This expedient was that James should resign the crown in favour of the Prince of Wales, and that the Prince of Wales should be bred a Protestant. If, as was but too probable, His Majesty should refuse to listen to this suggestion, he must at least consent to put forth a declaration which might do away the unfavourable impression made by his declaration of the preceding spring. A paper such as it was thought expedient that he should publish was carefully drawn up, and, after much discussion, approved. Early in the year 1693, Middleton, having been put in full possession of the views of the principal English Jacobites, stole across the Channel, and made his appearance at the court of James. There was at that court no want of slanderers and sneerers, whose malignity was only the more dangerous, because it wore a meek and sanctimonious air. Middleton found, on his arrival, that numerous lies, fabricated by the priests who feared and hated him, were already in circulation. Some non-compounders, too, had written from London that he was at heart a Presbyterian and a Republican. He was, however, very graciously received, and was appointed Secretary of State conjointly with Milford. It very soon appeared that James was fully resolved never to resign the crown, or to suffer the Prince of Wales to be bred a heretic, and it long seemed doubtful whether any arguments or entreaties would induce him to sign the declaration which his friends in England had prepared. It was, indeed, a document very different from any that had yet appeared under his great seal. He was made to promise that he would grant a free pardon to all his subjects who should not oppose him after he should land in the island, that, as soon as he was restored, he would call a parliament, that he would confirm all such laws, passed during the usurpation, 
as the houses should tender to him for confirmation, that he would waive his right to the chimney money, that he would protect and defend the established church in the enjoyment of all her possessions and privileges, that he would not again violate the Test Act, that he would leave it to the legislature to define the extent of his dispensing power, and that he would maintain the act of the settlement in Ireland. He struggled long and hard. He pleaded his conscience. Could a son of the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church bind himself to protect and defend heresy, and to enforce a law which excluded true believers from office? Some of the ecclesiastics who swarmed in his household told him that he could not without sin give any such pledge as his undutiful subjects demanded. On this point the opinion of Middleton, who was a Protestant, could be of no weight. But Middleton found an ally in one whom he regarded as a rival and an enemy. Melfort, scared by the universal hatred of which he knew himself to be the object, and afraid that he should be held accountable, both in England and in France, for his master's wrong-headedness, submitted the case to several eminent doctors of the Sorbonne. These learned Cassiwits pronounced the declaration unobjectable in a religious point of view. The great Bossuet, Bishop of Mew, who was regarded by the Gallican Church as a father scarcely inferior in authority to Cyprian or Augustine, showed by powerful arguments, both theological and political, that the scruple which tormented James was precisely of that sort against which a much wiser king had given a caution in the words, Be not righteous overmuch. The authority of the French divines was supported by the authority of the French government. The language held in Versailles was so strong that James began to be alarmed. What if Lewis should take serious offence, should think his hospitality ungratefully requited, should conclude a peace with the usurpers, and should request his unfortunate guests to seek another asylum? It was necessary to submit. On the 17th of April, 1693, the declaration was signed and sealed. The concluding sentence was a prayer. We come to vindicate our own right and to establish the liberties of our people and may God give us success in the prosecution of the one as we sincerely intend the confirmation of the other. The prayer was heard. The success of James was strictly proportioned to his sincerity. What his sincerity was, we know on the best evidence. Scarcely had he called on heaven to witness the truth of his professions, when he directed Melford to send a copy of the Declaration to Rome, with such explanations as might satisfy the Pope. Melford's letter ends thus. After all, the objection of this declaration is only to get us back to England. We shall fight the battle of the Catholics with much greater advantage at Whitehall than at St. Germain. Meanwhile, the document from which so much was expected had been dispatched to London. There it was printed at a secret press in the house of a Quaker, and there was among the Quakers a party, small in number, but zealous and active, which had imbibed the politics of William Penn. To circulate such a work was a service of some danger, but agents were found. Several persons were taken up while distributing copies in the streets of the city. A hundred packets were stopped in one day at the post office on their way to the fleet. But, after a short time, the government wisely gave up the endeavour to suppress what could not be suppressed, and published the declaration at full length, accompanied by a severe commentary. The commentary, however, was hardly needed. The declaration altogether failed to produce the effect which Middleton had anticipated. The truth is that his advice had not been asked till it mattered not what advice he gave. If James had put forth such a manifesto, in January 1689, the throne would probably not have been declared vacant. If he had put forth such a manifesto when he was on the coast of Normandy, at the head of an army, he would have conciliated a large part of the nation, and he might possibly have been joined by a large part of the fleet. But both in 1689 and in 1692 he had held the language of an implacable tyrant. 
and it was now too late to affect tenderness of heart and reverence for the constitution of the realm. The contrast between the new declaration and the preceding declaration excited, not without reason, general suspicion and contempt. What confidence could be placed in the word of a prince so unstable, of a prince who veered from extreme to extreme? In 1692, nothing would satisfy him but the heads and quarters of hundreds of poor ploughmen and boatmen who had several years before taken some rustic liberties with him at which his grandfather henry the fourth would have had a hearty laugh in sixteen ninety three the foulest and most ungrateful treasons were to be covered with oblivion caramarthen expressed the general sentiment i do not he said understand all this Last April I was to be hanged. This April I am to have a free pardon. I cannot imagine what I have done during the past year to deserve such goodness. The general opinion was that a snare was hidden under this unwanted clemency, this unwanted respect for the law. The declaration, it was said, was excellent, and so was the coronation oath. Everybody knew how King James had observed his coronation oath, and everybody might guess how he would observe his declaration. While grave men reasoned thus, the Whig jesters were not sparing of their pasquinades. Some of the non-compounders, meantime, uttered indignant murmurs. The king was in bad hands, in the hands of men who hated monarchy. His mercy was cruelty of the worst sort. The general pardon, which he had granted to his enemies, was in truth a general proscription of his friends hitherto the judges appointed by the usurper had been under a restraint imperfect indeed yet not absolutely negatory they had known that a day of reckoning might come and had therefore in general dealt tenderly with the persecuted adherents of the rightful king that restraint his majesty had now taken away he had told holt and treby that till he should land in england they might hang royalists without the smallest fear of being called to account. But by no class of people was the declaration read with so much disgust and indignation as by the native aristocracy of Ireland. This, then, was the reward of their loyalty. This was the faith of kings. When England had cast James out, when Scotland had rejected him, the Irish had been true to him, and he had, in return, solemnly given his sanction to a law which restored to them an immense domain of which they had been despoiled. Nothing that had happened since that time had diminished their claim to his favour. They had defended his cause to the last. They had fought for him long after he had deserted them. Many of them, when unable to contend longer against superior force, had followed him into banishment and now it appeared that he was desirous to make peace with his deadliest enemies at the expense of his most faithful friends. There was much discontent in the Irish regiments which were dispersed through the Netherlands and along the frontiers of Germany and Italy. Even the Whigs allowed that, for once, the O's and Max were in the right, and asked triumphantly whether a prince who had broken his word to his devoted servants could be expected to keep it to his foes. While the declaration was the subject of general conversation in England, military operations commenced on the continent. The preparations of France had been such as amazed even those who estimated most highly her resources and the abilities of her rulers. Both her agriculture and her commerce were suffering. The vineyards of Burgundy, the interminable cornfields of the Beuse, had failed to yield their increase. The looms of Lyon were silent, and the merchant ships were rotting in the harbour of Marseilles. Yet the monarchy presented to its numerous enemies a front more haughty and more menacing than ever. Lewis had determined not to make any advance toward a reconciliation with the new government of England till the whole strength of his realm had been put forth in one more effort a mighty effort in truth it was but too exhausting to be repeated he made an immense display of force at once on the pyrenees and on the alps on the rhine and on the meuse in the atlantic and in the mediterranean 
that nothing might be wanting which could excite the martial ardour of a nation eminently high-spirited he instituted a few days before he left his palace for the camp a new military order of knighthood and placed it under the protection of his own sainted ancestor and patron the new cross of st louis shone on the breasts of the gentlemen who had been conspicuous in the trenches before mons and namur and on the fields of fleurus and steinkirk and the sight raised a generous emulation among those who had still to win an honourable fame in arms in the week in which this celebrated order began to exist middleton visited versailles a letter in which he gave his friends in england an account of his visit has come down to us he was presented to lewis was most kindly received and was overpowered by gratitude and admiration of all the wonders of the court so middleton wrote its master was the greatest the splendour of the great king's personal merit threw even the splendour of his fortunes into the shade the language which his most christian majesty held about english politics was on the whole highly satisfactory yet in one thing this accomplished prince and his able and experienced ministers were strangely mistaken they were all possessed with the absurd notion that the prince of orange was a great man no pains had been spared to undeceive them but they were under an incurable delusion they saw through a magnifying glass of such power that the leech appeared to them a leviathan it ought to have occurred to middleton that possibly the delusion might be in his own vision and not in theirs lewis and the counsellors who surrounded him were far indeed from loving william but they did not hate him with that mad hatred which raged in the breasts of his english enemies middleton was one of the wisest and most moderate of the jacobites yet even middleton's judgment was so much darkened by malice that on this subject he talked nonsense unworthy of his capacity he like the rest of his party could see in the usurper nothing but what was odious and contemptible the heart of a fiend the understanding and manners of a stupid brutal dutch boor who generally observed a sulky silence and when forced to speak gave short testy answers in bad english the french statesman on the other hand judged of william's faculties from an intimate knowledge of the way in which he had during twenty years conducted affairs of the greatest moment and of the greatest difficulty he had ever since sixteen seventy three been playing against themselves a most complicated game of mixed chance and skill for an immense stake they were proud and with reason of their own dexterity at that game yet they were conscious that in him they had found more than their match at the commencement of the long contest every advantage had been on their side they had at their absolute command all the resources of the greatest kingdom in europe and he was merely the servant of a commonwealth of which the whole territory was inferior in extent to normandy or Dreen. a succession of generals and diplomatists of eminent ability had been opposed to him a powerful faction in his native country had pertinaciously crossed his designs he had undergone defeats in the field and defeats in the senate but his wisdom and firmness had turned defeats into victories notwithstanding all that could be done to keep him down his influence and fame had been almost constantly rising and spreading the most important and arduous enterprise in the history of modern europe had been planned and conducted to a prosperous termination by him alone the most extensive coalition that the world had seen for ages had been formed by him and would be instantly dissolved if his superintending care were withdrawn he had gained two kingdoms by statecraft and a third by conquest and he was still maintaining himself in the possession of all three in spite of both foreign and domestic foes that these things had been effected by a poor creature a man of the most ordinary capacity was an assertion which might easily find credence among the non-juring parsons who congregated at sam's coffee-house but which moved the laughter of the veteran politicians of versailles 
while middleton was in vain trying to convince the french that william was a greatly overrated man william who did full justice to middleton's merit felt much uneasiness at learning that the court of saint germain had called in the help of so able a counsellor but this was only one of a thousand causes of anxiety which during that spring pressed on the king's mind he was preparing for the opening of the campaign imploring his allies to be early in the field rousing the sluggish haggling with the greedy making up quarrels adjusting points of precedence he had to prevail on the cabinet of vienna to send timely succors into piedmont he had to keep a vigilant eye on those northern potentates who were trying to form a third party in europe he had to act as tutor to the elector of bavaria in the netherlands he had to provide for the defence of liege a matter which the authorities of liege coolly declared to be not at all their business but the business of england and holland he had to prevent the house of brunswick wolfenbuttel from going to blows with the house of brunswick lunenburg he had to accommodate a dispute between the prince of baden and the elector of saxony each of whom wished to be at the head of an army on the rhine and he had to manage the landgrave of hesse who omitted to furnish his own contingent and yet wanted to command the contingents furnished by other princes and now the time for action had arrived on the eighteenth of may lewis left versailles early in june he was under the walls of namur the princesses who had accompanied him held their court within the fortress he took under his immediate command the army of bufflers which was encamped at Gembleau. little more than a mile off lay the army of luxembourg the force collected in that neighbourhood under the french lilies did not amount to less than a hundred and twenty thousand men lewis had flattered himself that he should be able to repeat in sixteen ninety three the stratagem by which mons had been taken in sixteen ninety one and namur in sixteen ninety two and he had determined that either liege or brussels should be his prey but william had this year been able to assemble in good time a force inferior indeed to that which was opposed to him but still formidable with this force he took his post near louvain on the road between the two threatened cities and watched every movement of the enemy lewis was disappointed he found that it would not be possible for him to gratify his vanity so safely and so easily as in the preceding two years to sit down before a great town to enter the gates in triumph and to receive the keys without exposing himself to any risk greater than that of a stag hunt at fontainebleau before he could lay siege either to liege or to brussels he must fight and win a battle the chances were indeed greatly in his favour for his army was more numerous better officered and better disciplined than that of the allies luxembourg strongly advised him to march against william the aristocracy of france anticipated with intrepid gaiety a bloody but glorious day followed by a large distribution of the crosses of the new order william himself was perfectly aware of his danger and prepared to meet it with calm but mournful fortitude just at this conjuncture lewis announced his intention to return instantly to versailles and to send the dauphin and bouffers with part of the army which was assembled near namur to join marshal lorge who commanded in the palatinate luxembourg was thunderstruck he expostulated boldly and earnestly never he said was such an opportunity thrown away if his majesty could march against the prince of orange victory was almost certain could any advantage which it was possible to obtain on the rhine be set against the advantage of a victory gained in the heart of brabant over the principal army and the principal captain of the coalition the marshal reasoned he implored he went on his knees but in vain and he quitted the royal presence in the deepest dejection lewis left the camp a week after he had joined it and never afterwards made war in person End of section two. Recording by Sharon Chimura Dan of www.sharonmedia.net.
three of chapter twenty of the history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter twenty section three the astonishment was great throughout his army all the awe which he inspired could not prevent his old generals from grumbling and looking sullen. His young nobles from venting their spleen, sometimes in curses and sometimes in sarcasms, and even his common soldiers from holding irreverent language round their watchfires. His enemies rejoiced with vindictive and insulting joy. Was it not strange, they asked, that this great prince should have gone in state to the theatre of war, and then in a week have gone in the same state back again? Was it necessary that all that vast retinue, princesses, dames of honour and tirewomen, equerries and gentlemen of the bedchamber, cooks, confectioners and musicians, long trains of wagons, droves of led horses and sumpter mules, piles of plate, bales of tapestry, should travel four hundred miles merely in order that the most Christian king might look at his soldiers and then return. The ignominious truth was too evident to be concealed. He had gone to the Netherlands in the hope that he might again be able to snatch some military glory without any hazard to his person, and had hastened back rather than expose himself to the chances of a pitched field. This was not the first time that his most Christian majesty had shown the same kind of prudence. Seventeen years before he had been opposed under the wails of Bouchain to the same antagonist. William, with the ardour of a very young commander, had most imprudently offered battle. The opinion of the ablest generals was that, if Lewis had seized the opportunity, the war might have been ended in a day. The French army had eagerly asked to be led to the onset. The king had called his lieutenants around him and had collected their opinions. Some courtly officers, to whom a hint of his wishes had been dexterously conveyed, had, blushing and stammering with shame, voted against fighting. It was to no purpose that bold and honest men, who prized his honour more than his life, had proved to him that on all principles of the military art, he ought to accept the challenge rashly given by the enemy. His Majesty had gravely expressed his sorrow that he could not, consistently with his public duty, obey the impetuous movement of his blood, had turned his rein, and had galloped back to his quarters. Was it not frightful to think what rivers of the best blood of France, of Spain, of Germany, and of England had flowed, and were destined still to flow, for the gratification of a man who wanted the vulgar courage which was found in the meanest of the hundreds of thousands whom he had sacrificed to his vainglorious ambition. Though the French army in the Netherlands had been weakened by the departure of the forces commanded by the Dauphin and the Boufflers, and though the allied army was daily strengthened by the arrival of fresh troops, Luxembourg still had a superiority of force, and that superiority he increased by an adroit stratagem. He marched towards Liège, and made as if he were about to form the siege of that city. William was uneasy 
and the more uneasy because he knew that there was a French party among the inhabitants. He quitted his position near Louvain, advanced to Nether Hespen, and encamped there with the river Get in his rear. On his march he learned that Hoy had opened its gates to the French. The news increased his anxiety about Liège, and determined him to send thither a force sufficient to overawe malcontents within the city, and to repel any attack from without. This was exactly what Luxembourg had expected and desired. His feint had served its purpose. He turned his back on the fortress which had hitherto seemed to be his object, and hastened toward the get. William, who had detached more than twenty thousand men, and who had but fifty thousand left in his camp, was alarmed by learning from his scouts on the 18th of July that the French general, with near eighty thousand, was close at hand. It was still in the king's power, by a hasty retreat, to put the narrow but deep waters of the Get, which had lately been swollen by rains, between his army and the enemy. But the site which he occupied was strong, and it could easily be made still stronger. He set all his troops to work. Ditches were dug, mounds thrown up, palisades fixed in the earth. In a few hours the ground wore a new aspect, and the king trusted that he should be able to repel the attack even of a force greatly outnumbering his own. Nor was it without much appearance of reason that he felt this confidence. When the morning of the 19th of July broke, the bravest men of Lewis's army looked gravely and anxiously on the fortress which had suddenly sprung up to arrest their progress. The allies were protected by a breastwork. Here and there along the entrenchments were formed little redoubts and half-moons. A hundred pieces of cannon were disposed along the ramparts. On the left flank the village of Romsdorf rose close to the little stream of Landen from which the English have named the disastrous day. On the right was the village of Neerwinden. Both villages were, after the fashion of the Low Countries, surrounded by moats and fences, and within these enclosures the little plots of ground occupied by different families were separated by mud walls five feet in height and a foot in thickness. All these barricades William had repaired and strengthened. St. Simon, who after the battle surveyed the ground, could hardly, he tells us, believe that defences so extensive and so formidable could have been created with such rapidity. Luxembourg, however, was determined to try whether even this position could be maintained against the superior numbers and the impetuous valour of his soldiers. Soon after sunrise the roar of cannon began to be heard. William's batteries did much execution before the French artillery could be so placed as to return the fire. It was eight o'clock before the close fighting began. The village of Neerwinden was regarded by both commanders as the point on which everything depended. There an attack was made by the French left wing, commanded by Mont Chevreuil, a veteran officer of high reputation, and by Berwick, who, though young, was fast rising to a high place among the captains of his time. Berwick led the onset and forced his way into the village but was soon driven out again with a terrible carnage. His followers fled or perished, while he, trying to rally them, and cursing them for not doing their duty better, 
was surrounded by foes. He concealed his white cockade, and hoped to be able, by the help of his native tongue, to pass himself off as an officer of the English army. But his face was recognized by one of his mother's brothers, George Churchill, who held on that day the command of a brigade. A hurried embrace was exchanged between the kinsmen, and the uncle conducted the nephew to William, who, as long as everything seemed to be going well, remained in the rear. The meeting of the king and the captive, united by such close domestic ties, and divided by such inexpiable injuries, was a strange sight. Both behaved as became them. William uncovered and addressed to his prisoner a few words of courteous greeting. Berwick's only reply was a solemn bow. The king put on his hat, the duke put on his hat, and the cousins parted for ever. By this time the French, who had been driven in confusion out of near Winden, had been reinforced by division under the command of the Duke of Bourbon, and came gallantly back to the attack. William, well aware of the importance of this post, gave orders that troops should move thither from other parts of his line. This second conflict was long and bloody. The assailants again forced an entrance into the village. They were again driven out with immense slaughter, and showed little inclination to return to the charge. Meanwhile the battle had been raging all along the entrenchments of the Allied army. Again and again Luxembourg brought up his troops within pistol-shot of the breastwork, but he could bring them no nearer. Again and again they recoiled from the heavy fire which was poured on their front and on their flanks. It seemed that all was over. Luxembourg retired to a spot which was out of gunshot, and summoned a few of his chief officers to a consultation. They talked together during some time, and their animated gestures were observed with deep interest by all who were within sight. At length Luxembourg formed his decision. A last attempt must be made to carry near Winden, and the invincible household troops, the conquerors of Steinkirk, must lead the way. The household troops came on in a manner worthy of their long and terrible renown. A third time near Winden was taken. A third time William tried to retake it. At the head of some English regiments he charged the guards of Lewis with such fury that for the first time in the memory of the oldest warrior that far-famed band gave way. It was only by the strenuous exertions of Luxembourg, of the Duke of Chartres, and of the Duke of Bourbon, that the broken ranks were rallied, but by this time the centre and left of the Allied army had been so much thinned for the purpose of supporting the conflict at Neerwinden, that the entrenchments could no longer be defended on other points. A little after four in the afternoon, the whole line gave way. All was havoc and confusion. Solmes had received a mortal wound, and fell, still alive, into the hands of the enemy. The English soldiers, to whom his name was hateful, accused him of having, in his sufferings, shown pusillanimity unworthy of a soldier. The Duke of Ormond was struck down in the press, and in another moment he would have been a corpse, had not a rich diamond on his finger caught the eye of one of the French guards, who justly thought that the owner of such a jewel would be a valuable prisoner. The Duke's life was saved, and he was speedily exchanged for Berwick. Ruvigny 
animated by the true refugee hatred of the country which had cast him out, was taken fighting in the thickest of the battle. Those into whose hands he had fallen knew him well, and knew that if they carried him into their camp, his head would pay for that treason to which persecution had driven him. With admirable generosity they pretended not to recognize him, and suffered him to make his escape in the tumult. It was only on such occasions as this that the whole greatness of William's character appeared. Amidst the rout and uproar, while arms and standards were flung away, while multitudes of fugitives were choking up the bridges and fords of the Get, or perishing in its waters, the king, having directed Talmash to superintend the retreat, put himself at the head of a few brave regiments, and by desperate efforts arrested the progress of the enemy. His risk was greater than that which others ran, for he could not be persuaded either to encumber his feeble frame with a cuirass, or to hide the ensigns of the garter. He thought his star a good rallying point for his own troops, and only smiled when he was told that it was a good mark for the enemy. Many fell on his right hand and on his left. Two led horses, which in the field always closely followed his persons, were struck dead by cannon shots. One musket ball passed through the curls of his wig, another through his coat, a third bruised his side and tore his blue ribband to tatters. Many years later, old pensioners who crept about the arcades and alleys of Chelsea Hospital used to relate how he charged at the head of Galway's horse, how he dismounted four times to put heart into the infantry, how he rallied one corps which seemed to be shrinking. That is not the way to fight, gentlemen. You must stand up close to them. Thus, gentlemen, thus. You might have seen him, an eyewitness wrote, only four days after the battle, with his sword in his hand, throwing himself upon the enemy. It is certain that one time, among the rest, he was seen at the head of two English regiments, and that he fought seven with these two in sight of the whole army, driving them before him above a quarter of an hour. Thanks be to God that preserved him. The enemy pressed on him so close that it was with difficulty that he at length made his way over the get. A small body of brave men who shared his peril to the last could hardly keep off the pursuers as he crossed the bridge. Never, perhaps, was the change which the progress of civilization has produced in the art of war more strikingly illustrated than on that day. Ajax beating down on the Trojan leader with a rock which two ordinary men could scarcely lift, Horatius defending the bridge against an army, Richard the lion-hearted spurring along the whole Saracen line without finding an enemy to stand his assault, Robert Bruce crushing with one blow the helmet and head of Sir Henry Bohun in sight of the whole array of England and Scotland. Such are the heroes of a dark age. In such an age bodily vigour is the most indispensable qualification of a warrior. At Landon two poor sickly beings, who in a rude state of society would have been regarded as too puny to bear any part in combats, were the souls of two great armies. In some heathen countries they would have been exposed while infants. In Christendom they would, six hundred years earlier, have been sent to some quiet cloister. But their lot had fallen on a time when men had discovered that the strength of the muscles is far inferior in value 
to the strength of the mind. It is probable that, among the hundred and twenty thousand soldiers who were marshalled round near Winden, under all the standards of Western Europe, the two feeblest in body were the hunchbacked dwarf who urged forward the fiery onset of France, and the asthmatic skeleton who covered the slow retreat of England. The French were victorious, but they had bought their victory dear. More than ten thousand of the best troops of Lewis had fallen. Near Winden was a spectacle at which the oldest soldiers stood aghast. The streets were piled breast-high with corpses. Among the slain were some great lords and some renowned warriors. Montchevroy was there, and the mutilated trunk of the Duke of Uzes, first in order of precedence among the whole aristocracy of France. Thence, too, Sarsfield was born, desperately wounded to a pallet from which he never rose again. The court of Saint-Germain had conferred on him the empty title of Earl of Lucan, but history knows him by the name which is still dear to the most unfortunate of nations. The region, renowned in history as the battlefield during many ages of the most warlike nations of Europe, has seen only two more terrible days, the day of Malplaquet and the day of Waterloo. During many months the ground was strewn with skulls and bones of men and horses, and with fragments of hats and shoes, saddles and holsters. The next summer the soil, fertilized by twenty thousand corpses, broke forth into millions of poppies. The traveller who, on the road from St. Tron to Turlimont, saw that vast sheet of rich scarlet spreading from Landen to near Winden, could hardly keep fancying that the figurative prediction of the Hebrew prophet was literally accomplished, that the earth was disclosing her blood and refusing to cover the slain. There was no pursuit, though the sun was still high in the heaven when William crossed the Get. The conquerors were so much exhausted by marching and fighting that they could scarcely move, and the horses were in even worse condition than the men. Their general thought it necessary to allow some time for rest and refreshment. The French nobles unloaded their sumpter horses supped gaily and pledged one another in champagne amidst the heaps of dead and when night fell whole brigades gladly lay down to sleep in their ranks on the field of battle the inactivity of luxembourg did not escape censure none could deny that he had in the action shown great skill and energy but some complained that he wanted patience and perseverance. Others whispered that he had no wish to bring to an end a war which made him necessary to a court where he had never, in time of peace, found favour or even justice. Lewis, who on this occasion was perhaps not altogether free from some emotions of jealousy, contrived it was reported to mingle with the praise which he bestowed on his lieutenant, blame, which, though delicately expressed, was perfectly intelligible. In the battle, he said, the Duke of Luxembourg behaved like Condé, and since the battle the Prince of Orange has behaved like Turenne. In truth, the ability and vigour with which William repaired his terrible defeat, might well excite admiration. In one respect, said the Admiral Coligny, I may claim superiority over Alexander, over Scipio, over Caesar. They won great battles, it is true. I have lost four great battles, and yet I show to the enemy 
a more formidable front than ever. The blood of Coligny ran in the veins of William, and with the blood had descended the unconquerable spirit which could derive from failure as much glory as happier commanders owed to success. The defeat of Landon was indeed a heavy blow. The king had a few days of cruel anxiety. If Luxembourg pushed on, all was lost. Louvain must fall, and Mechlin, Neuport, and Ostend. The Batavian frontier would be in danger. The cry for peace throughout Holland might be such as neither states-general nor stadtholder would be able to resist. But there was delay, and a very short delay was enough for William. From the field of battle he made his way through the multitude of fugitives to the neighbourhood of Louvain, and there began to collect his scattered forces. His character is not lowered by the anxiety which, at that moment, the most disastrous of his life, he felt for the two persons who were dearest to him. As soon as he was safe, he wrote to assure his wife of his safety. In the confusion of the flight, he had lost sight of Portland, who was then in very feeble health, and had therefore run more than the ordinary risks of war. A short note which the king sent to his friend a few hours later is still extant. Though I hope to see you this evening, I cannot help writing to tell you how rejoiced I am that you got off so well. God grant that your health may soon be quite restored. These are great trials which he has been pleased to send me in quick succession. I must try to submit to his pleasure without murmuring, and to deserve his anger less. End of section 3of chapter 20 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter 20 section 4 his forces rallied fast large bodies of troops which he had, perhaps imprudently, detached from his army, while he supposed that Liège was the object of the enemy, rejoined him by forced marches. Three weeks after his defeat, he held a review a few miles from Brussels. The number of men under arms was greater than on the morning of the bloody day of Landen. Their appearance was soldier-like, and their spirit seemed unbroken. William now wrote to Heinzius that the worst was over. The crisis, he said, has been a terrible one. Thank God it has ended thus. He did not, however, think it prudent to try at that time the event of another pitched field. He therefore suffered the French to besiege and take Charleroi and this was the only advantage which they derived from the most sanguinary battle fought in Europe during the seventeenth century. The melancholy tidings of the defeat of Landen found England agitated by tidings not less melancholy from a different quarter. During many months the trade with the Mediterranean Sea had been almost entirely interrupted by the war. There was no chance that a merchantman from London or from Amsterdam would, if unprotected, reach the Pillars of Hercules without being boarded by a French privateer, and the protection of armed vessels was not easily to be obtained. During the year 1691, great fleets, richly laden for Spanish, Italian, and Turkish markets, had been gathering in the Thames and the Texel. In February 1693, 
near four hundred ships were ready to start the value of the cargoes was estimated at several millions sterling those galleons which had long been the wonder and envy of the world had never conveyed so precious a freight from the west indies to seville the english government undertook in concert with the dutch government to escort the vessels which were laden with this great mass of wealth the french government was bent on intercepting them the plan of the allies was that seventy ships of the line and about thirty frigates and brigantines should assemble in the channel under the command of killigrew and delaval the two new lords of the english admiralty and should convoy the smyrna fleet as it was popularly called beyond the limits within which any danger could be apprehended from the brest squadron the greater part of the armament might then return to guard the channel while rook with twenty sail might accompany the trading vessels and might protect them against the squadron which lay at toulon the plan of the french government was that the brest squadron under tourville and the toulon squadron under estries should meet in the neighbourhood of the straits of gibraltar and should lie there in wait for the booty which plan was the better conceived may be doubted which was the better executed is a question which admits of no doubt the whole french navy whether in the atlantic or the mediterranean was moved by one will the navy of england and the navy of the united provinces were subject to different authorities and both in england and in the united provinces the power was divided and subdivided to such an extent that no single person was pressed by a heavy responsibility the spring came the merchants loudly complained that they had already lost more by delay than they could hope to gain by the most successful voyage and still the ships of war were not half manned or half provisioned the amsterdam squadron did not arrive on our coast till late in april the zealand squadron not till the middle of may it was june before the immense fleet near five hundred sail lost sight of the cliffs of england tourville was already on the sea and was steering southward but killigrew and delaval were so negligent or so unfortunate that they had no intelligence of his movements they at first took it for granted that he was still lying in the port of brest then they heard a rumour that some shipping had been seen to the northward and they supposed that he was taking advantage of their absence to threaten the coast of devonshire it never seems to have occurred to them as possible that he might have effected a junction with the toulon squadron and might be impatiently waiting for his prey in the neighbourhood of gibraltar they therefore on the sixth of june having convoyed the smyrna fleet about two hundred miles beyond ushant announced their intention to part company with rook rook expostulated but to no purpose it was necessary for him to submit and to proceed with his twenty men of war to the mediterranean while his superiors with the rest of the armament returned to the channel it was by this time known in england that tourville had stolen out of brest and was hastening to join estrays the return of killigrew and delaval therefore excited great alarm a swift sailing vessel was instantly dispatched to warn rook of his danger but the warning never reached him he ran before a fair wind to cape st vincent and there he learned that some french ships were lying in the neighbouring bay of lagos the first information which he received led him to believe that they were few in number and so dexterously did they conceal their strength that till they were within half an hour's sail he had no suspicion 
that he was opposed to the whole maritime strength of a great kingdom. To contend against fourfold odds would have been madness. It was much that he was able to save his squadron from titter destruction. He exerted all his skill. Two or three Dutchmen of war, which were in the rear, courageously sacrificed themselves to save the fleet. With the rest of the armament, and with about sixty merchant ships, Rook got safe to Madeira and thence to Cork. But more than three hundred of the vessels which he had convoyed were scattered over the ocean. Some escaped to Ireland, some to Corunna, some to Lisbon, some to Cadiz. Some were captured and more destroyed. A few, which had taken shelter under the rock of Gibraltar, and were pursued thither by the enemy, were sunk when it was found that they could not be defended. Others perished in the same manner under the batteries of Malaga. The gain to the French seems not to have been great, but the loss to England and Holland was immense. Never, within the memory of man, had there been in the city a day of more gloom and agitation than that on which the news of the encounter in the Bay of Lagos arrived. Many merchants, and eyewitness said, went away from the Royal Exchange as pale as if they had received sentence of death. A deputation from the merchants who had been sufferers by this great disaster went up to the Queen with an address representing their grievances. They were admitted to the council chamber, where she was seated at the head of the board. She directed Summers to reply to them in her name, and he addressed to them a speech well calculated to soothe their irritation. Her Majesty, he said, felt for them from her heart, and she had already appointed a committee of the Privy Council to inquire into the cause of the late misfortune, and to consider of the best means of preventing similar misfortunes in time to come. This answer gave so much satisfaction that the Lord Mayor soon came to the palace to thank the Queen for her goodness to assure her that through all vicissitudes London would be true to her and her consort, and to inform her that, severely as the late calamity had been felt by many great commercial houses, the Common Council had unanimously resolved to advance whatever might be necessary for the support of the government. The ill-humour which the public calamities naturally produced, was inflamed by every factious artifice. Never had the Jacobite pamphleteers been so savagely scurrilous as during this unfortunate summer. The police was consequently more active than ever in seeking for the dens from which so much treason proceeded. With great difficulty, and after long search, the most important of all the unlicensed presses was discovered. This press belonged to a Jacobite named William Anderton, whose intrepidity and fanaticism marked him out as fit to be employed on services from which prudent men and scrupulous men shrink. During two years he had been watched by the agents of the government, but where he exercised his craft was an impenetrable mystery. At length he was tracked to a house near St. James Street, where he was known by a feigned name, and where he passed for a working jeweller. A messenger of the press went thither with several assistants, and found Anderton's wife and mother posted as sentinels at the door. The women knew the messenger, rushed on him, tore his hair, and cried out, Thieves! and murder! The alarm was thus given to Anderton, 
he concealed the instruments of his calling, came forth with an assured air, and bade defiance to the messenger, the censor, the secretary, and little hook-nose himself. After a struggle, he was secured. His room was searched, and at first sight no evidence of his guilt appeared, but behind the bed was soon found a door which opened into a dark closet. The closet contained a press, types, and heaps of newly printed papers. One of these papers, entitled Remarks on the Present Confederacy and the Late Revolution, is perhaps the most frantic of all the Jacobite libels. In this tract, the Prince of Orange is gravely accused of having ordered fifty of his wounded English soldiers to be burned alive. The governing principle of his whole conduct, it is said, is not vainglory or ambition or avarice, but a deadly hatred of Englishmen and a desire to make them miserable. The nation is vehemently adjured, on peril of incurring the severest judgments, to rise up and free itself from this plague this curse, this tyrant, whose depravity makes it difficult to believe that he can have been procreated by a human pair. Many copies were also found of another paper, somewhat less ferocious, but perhaps more dangerous, entitled A French Conquest Neither Desirable Nor Practicable. In this tract also the people are exhorted to rise in insurrection. They are assured that a great part of the army is with them. The forces of the Prince of Orange will melt away. He will be glad to make his escape, and a charitable hope is sneeringly expressed that it may not be necessary to do him any harm beyond sending him back to Loo where he may live surrounded by luxuries for which the English have paid dear. The government, provoked and alarmed by the virulence of the Jacobite pamphleteers, determined to make Anderton an example. He was indicted for high treason and brought to the bar of the Old Bailey. Treby, now Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, and Powell, who had honourably distinguished himself on the day of the trial of the bishops, were on the bench. It is unfortunate that no detailed report of the evidence has come down to us, and that we are forced to content ourselves with such fragments of information as can be collected from the contradictory narratives of writers evidently partial, intemperate, and dishonest. The indictment however, is extant, and the overt acts which it imputes to the prisoner undoubtedly amount to high treason. To exhort the subjects of the realm to rise up and depose the king by force, and to add to that exhortation the expression, evidently ironical, of a hope that it may not be necessary to inflict on him any evil worse than banishment, is surely an offence which the least courtly lawyer will admit to be within the scope of the statute of Edward the Third. On this point, indeed, there seems to have been no dispute, either at the trial or subsequently. The prisoner denied that he had printed the libels. On this point it seems reasonable that, since the evidence has not come down to us, we should give credit to the judges and the jury who heard what the witnesses had to say. One argument with which Anderton had been furnished by his advisers, and which, in the Jacobite pasquinades of that time, is represented as unanswerable, was that, as the art of printing had been unknown in the reign of Edward the Third, printing could not be an overt act of treason under a statute of that reign. The judges treated this argument 
very lightly, and they were surely justified in so treating it, for it is an argument which would lead to the conclusion that it could not be an overt act of treason to behead a king with a guillotine or to shoot him with a miney rifle. It was also urged in Anderton's favour, and this was undoubtedly an argument well entitled to consideration, that a distinction ought to be made between the author of a treasonable paper and the man who merely printed it. The former could not pretend that he had not understood the meaning of the words which he had himself selected, but to the latter those words might convey no meaning whatever. The metaphors, the allusions, the sarcasms might be far beyond his comprehension, and while his hands were busy among the types, his thoughts might be wandering to things altogether unconnected with the manuscript which was before him. It is undoubtedly true that it may be no crime to print what it would be a great crime to write, but this evidently is a matter concerning which no general rule can be laid down. Whether Anderton had, as a mere mechanic, contributed to spread a work the tendency of which he did not suspect, or had knowingly lent his help to raise a rebellion, was a question for the jury, and the jury might reasonably infer from his change of his name, from the secret manner in which he worked, from the strict watch kept by his wife and mother, and from the fury with which, even in the grasp of the messengers, he railed at the government, that he was not the unconscious tool, but the intelligent and zealous accomplice of traitors. The Twelve, after passing a considerable time in deliberation, informed the court that one of them entertained doubts. Those doubts were removed by the arguments of Treby and Powell, and a verdict of guilty was found. The fate of the prisoner remained during some time in suspense. The ministers hoped that he might be induced to save his own neck at the expense of the necks of the pamphleteers who had employed him. But his natural courage was kept up by spiritual stimulants which the non-juring divines well understood how to administer. He suffered death with fortitude and continued to revile the government to the last. The Jacobites clamoured loudly against the cruelty of the judges who had tried him, and of the Queen who had left him for execution, and, not very consistently, represented him at once as a poor, ignorant artisan who was not aware of the nature and tendency of the act for which he suffered, and as a martyr who had heroically laid down his life for the banished king and the persecuted church. The ministers were much mistaken if they flattered themselves that the fate of Anderton would deter others from imitating his example. His execution produced several pamphlets scarcely less virulent than those for which he had suffered. Collier, in what he calls Remarks on the London Gazette, exulted with cruel joy over the carnage of Landon and the vast destruction of English property on the coast of Spain. Other writers did their best to raise riots among the labouring people, for the doctrine of the Jacobites was that disorder, in whatever place or in whatever way it might begin, was likely to end in a restoration, a phase which, without a commentary, may seem to be mere nonsense, but which was really full of meaning, was often in their mouths at this time, and was indeed a password by which the members of the party recognized each other. Box it about, it will come to my father. 
the hidden sense of this gibberish was throw the country into confusion it will be necessary at last to have recourse to king james trade was not prosperous and many industrious men were out of work accordingly songs addressed to the distressed classes were composed by the malcontent street poets numerous copies of a ballad exhorting the weavers to rise against the government were discovered in the house of that quaker who had printed james declaration every art was used for the purpose of exciting discontent in a much more formidable body of men the sailors and unhappily the vices of the naval administration furnish the enemies of the state with but too good a choice of inflammatory topics some seamen deserted some mutinied then came executions and then came more ballads and broadsides representing those executions as barbarous murders reports that the government had determined to defraud its defenders of their hard-earned pay were circulated with so much effect that a great crowd of women from wapping and rotherhithe besieged whitehall clamouring for what was due to their husbands mary had the good sense and good nature to order four of these importunate petitioners to be admitted into the room where she was holding a council she heard their complaints and herself assured them that the rumour which had alarmed them was unfounded by this time st bartholomew's day drew near and the great annual fair the delight of idle apprentices and the horror of puritanical aldermen was opened in smithfield with the usual display of dwarfs giants and dancing dogs the man that ate fire and the elephant that loaded and fired a musket but of all the shows none proved as attractive as a dramatic performance which in conception though doubtless not in execution seems to have borne much resemblance to those immortal masterpieces of humour in which aristophanes held up cleon and lamachus to derision two strollers personated killigrew and delaval the admirals were represented as flying with their whole fleet before a few french privateers and taking shelter under the grins of the tower the office of chorus was performed by a jack pudding who expressed very freely his opinion of the naval administration immense crowds flocked to see this strange farce the applauses were loud the receipts were great and the mountebanks who had first ventured to attack only the unlucky and unpopular board of admiralty now emboldened by impunity and success and probably prompted and rewarded by persons of much higher station than their own began to cast reflections on other departments of the government this attempt to revive the license of the attic stage was soon brought to a close by the appearance of a strong body of constables who carried off the actors to prison meanwhile the streets of london were every night strewn with seditious handbills at all the taverns the zealots of hereditary right were limping about with glasses of wine and punch at their lips this fashion had come in and the uninitiated wondered much that so great a number of jolly gentlemen should have suddenly become lame but those who were in the secret knew that the word limp was a consecrated word that every one of the four letters which composed it was the initial of an august name and that the loyal subject who limped while he drank was taking off his bumper to lewis james mary and the prince end of section four
Section five of Chapter twenty of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter twenty, Section five. It was not only in the capital that the Jacobites at this time made a great display of their wit. They mustered strong at Bath, where the Lord President Carmarthen was trying to recruit his feeble health. Every evening they met, as they phrased it, to serenade the Marquess. In other words, they assembled under the sick man's window, and there sang doggerel lampoons on him. It is remarkable that the Lord President, at the very time at which he was insulted as a Williamite at Bath, was considered as a staunch Jacobite at St. Germain's. How he came to be so considered is a most perplexing question. Some writers are of opinion that he, like Shrewsbury, Russell, Godolphin, and Marlborough, entered into engagements with one king while eating the bread of the other. But this opinion does not rest on sufficient proofs. About the treasons of Shrewsbury, of Russell, of Godolphin, and of Marlborough, we have a great mass of evidence, derived from various sources and extending over several years. But all the information which we possess about Carmarthen's dealings with James is contained in a single short paper written by Melfort on the 16th of October, 1693. From that paper it is quite clear that some intelligence had reached the banished king and his ministers, which led them to regard Carmarthen as a friend. But there is no proof that they ever so regarded him, either before that day or after that day. On the whole, the most probable explanation of this mystery seems to be that Carmarthen had been sounded by some Jacobite emissary much less artful than himself, and had, for the purpose of getting at the bottom of the new scheme of policy devised by Middleton, pretended to be well disposed to the cause of the banished king, that an exaggerated account of what had passed had been sent to St. Germain's, and that there had been much rejoicing there at a conversion which soon proved to have been feigned. It seems strange that such a conversion should even for a moment have been thought sincere. It was plainly Carmarthen's interest to stand by the sovereigns in possession. He was their chief minister. He could not hope to be the chief minister of James. It can indeed hardly be supposed that the political conduct of a cunning old man, insatiably ambitious and covetous, was much influenced by personal partiality. But if there were any person to whom Carmarthen was partial, that person was undoubtedly Mary, that he had seriously engaged in a plot to depose her, at the risk of his head if he failed, and with the certainty of losing immense power and wealth if he succeeded, was a story too absurd for any credulity but the credulity of exiles. Carmarthen had indeed at that moment peculiarly strong reasons for being satisfied with the place which he held in the councils of William and Mary. There is but too strong reason to believe that he was then accumulating unlawful gain with the rapidity unexampled even in his experience. The contest between the two East India companies was, during the autumn of 1693, fiercer than ever. The House of Commons, finding the old company obstinately averse to all compromise, had, a little before the close of the late session, requested the king to give the three years' warning prescribed by the charter. Child and his fellows now began to be seriously alarmed. They expected every day to receive the dreaded notice. Nay, they were not sure that their exclusive privilege might not be taken away without any notice at all. For they found that they had, by inadvertently omitting to pay the tax lately imposed on their stock at the precise time fixed by law, forfeited their charter, and though it would, in ordinary circumstances, have been thought cruel in the government to take advantage of such a slip the public was not inclined to allow the old company anything more than the strict letter of the bond. Everything was lost if the charter were not renewed before the meeting of Parliament. There can be little doubt that the proceedings of the corporation were still really directed by child, but he had, it should seem, perceived that his unpopularity had injuriously affected the interests which were under his care, and therefore did not obtrude himself on the public notice. His place was ostensibly filled by his near kinsman Sir Thomas Cook, one of the greatest merchants of London and member of Parliament for the borough of Colchester. The directors placed at Cook's absolute disposal all the immense wealth which lay in their treasury. 
and in a short time near a hundred thousand pounds were expended in corruption on a gigantic scale. In what proportions this enormous sum was distributed among the great men at Whitehall, and how much of it was embezzled by intermediate agents, is still a mystery. We know with certainty, however, that thousands went to Seymour and thousands to Carmarthen. The effect of these bribes was that the Attorney General received orders to draw up a charter regranting the old privileges to the old company. No minister, however, could, after what had passed in Parliament, venture to advise the Crown to renew the monopoly without conditions. The directors were sensible that they had no choice, and reluctantly consented to accept the new charter on terms substantially the same with those which the House of Commons had sanctioned. It is probable that, two years earlier, such a compromise would have quieted the feud which distracted the city, but a long conflict in which satire and calumny had not been spared had heated the minds of men. The cry of Dowgate against Leadenhall Street was louder than ever. Caveats were entered, petitions were signed, and in those petitions a doctrine which had hitherto been studiously kept in the background was boldly affirmed. While it was doubtful on which side the royal prerogative would be used, that prerogative had not been questioned, but as soon as it appeared that the old company was likely to obtain a regrant of the monopoly under the great seal, the new company began to assert with vehemence that no monopoly could be created except by act of Parliament. The Privy Council, over which Carmarthen presided, after hearing the matter fully argued by counsel on both sides, decided in favour of the old company, and ordered the charter to be sealed. The autumn was by this time far advanced, and the armies in the Netherlands had gone into quarters for the winter. On the last day of October William landed in England. The Parliament was about to meet, and he had every reason to expect a session even more stormy than the last. The people were discontented, and not without cause. The year had been everywhere disastrous to the Allies, not only on the sea and in the Low Countries, but also in Servia, in Spain, in Italy, and in Germany. The Turks had compelled the generals of the Empire to raise the siege of Belgrade. A newly created Marshal of France, the Duke of Noailles, had invaded Catalonia and taken the fortress of Rosas. Another newly created marshal, the skilful and valiant Catena, had descended from the Alps on Piedmont, and had, at Marsiglia, gained a complete victory over the forces of the Duke of Savoy. This battle is memorable as the first of a long series of battles in which the Irish troops retrieved the honour lost by misfortunes and misconduct in domestic war. Some of the exiles of Limerick showed, on that day, under the standard of France, a valour which distinguished them among many thousands of brave men. It is remarkable that on the same day a battalion of the persecuted and expatriated Huguenots stood firm amidst the general disorder round the standard of Savoy, and fell fighting desperately to the last. The Duke of Lorge had marched into the Palatinate, already twice devastated, and had found that Turenne and Duras had left him something to destroy. Heidelberg, just beginning to rise again from its ruins, was again sacked, the peaceable citizens butchered, their wives and daughters foully outraged. The very choirs of the churches were stained with blood, the pyxes and crucifixes were torn from the altars, the tombs of the ancient electors were broken open, the corpses, stripped of their cerecloths and ornaments, were dragged about the streets. The skull of the father of the Duchess of Orléans was beaten to fragments by the soldiers of a prince among the ladies of whose splendid court she held the foremost place. And yet a discerning eye might have perceived that, unfortunate as the Confederates seemed to have been, the advantage had really been on their side. The contest was quite as much a financial as a military contest. The French king had, some months before, said that the last piece of gold would carry the day, and he now began painfully to feel the truth of the saying. England was undoubtedly hard-pressed by public burdens, but still she stood up erect. France, meanwhile, was fast sinking. Her recent efforts had been too much for her strength, and had left her spent and unnerved. Never had her rulers shown more ingenuity in devising taxes, or more severity in exacting them. But by no ingenuity, by no severity, was it possible to raise the sums necessary for another such campaign as that of 1693. In England the harvest had been abundant. In France the corn and the wine had again failed. The people, as usual, railed at the government, 
the government, with shameful ignorance or more shameful dishonesty, tried to direct the public indignation against the dealers in grain. Decrees appeared which seemed to have been elaborately framed for the purpose of turning dearth into famine. The nation was assured that there was no reason for uneasiness, that there was more than a sufficient supply of food, and that the scarcity had been produced by the villainous arts of misers, who locked up their stores in the hope of making enormous gains. Commissioners were appointed to inspect the granaries, and were empowered to send to market all the corn that was not necessary for the consumption of the proprietors. Such interference, of course, increased the suffering which it was meant to relieve. But in the midst of the general distress, there was an artificial plenty in one favored spot. The most arbitrary prince must always stand in some awe of an immense mass of human beings collected in the neighborhood of his own palace. Apprehensions similar to those which had induced the Caesars to extort from Africa and Egypt the means of pampering the rabble of Rome, induced Louis to aggravate the misery of twenty provinces for the purpose of keeping one huge city in good humor. He ordered bread to be distributed in all the parishes of the capital at less than half the market price. The English Jacobites were stupid enough to extol the wisdom and humanity of this arrangement. The harvest, they said, had been good in England and bad in France, and yet the loaf was cheaper at Paris than in London, and the explanation was simple. The French had a sovereign whose heart was French, and who watched over his people with the solicitude of a father, while the English were cursed with a Dutch tyrant, who sent their corn to Holland. The truth was that a week of such fatherly government as that of Louis would have raised all England in arms from Northumberland to Cornwall. That there might be abundance at Paris, the people of Normandy and Anjou were stuffing themselves with nettles. That there might be tranquillity at Paris, the peasantry were fighting with the bargemen and the troops all along the Loire and the Seine. Multitudes fled from those rural districts where bread cost five sous a pound to the happy place where bread was to be had for two sous a pound. It was necessary to drive the famished crowds back by force from the barriers, and to denounce the most terrible punishments against all who should not go home and starve quietly. Louis was sensible that the strength of France had been overstrained by the exertions of the last campaign. Even if her harvest and her vintage had been abundant, she would not have been able to do in 1694 what she had done in 1693. And it was utterly impossible that, in a season of extreme distress, she should again send into the field armies superior in number on every point to the armies of the coalition. New conquests were not to be expected. It would be much if the harassed and exhausted land, beset on all sides by enemies, should be able to sustain a defensive war without any disaster. So able a politician as the French king could not but feel that it would be for his advantage to treat with the allies while they were so awed by the remembrance of the gigantic efforts which his kingdom had just made, and before the collapse which had followed those efforts should become visible. He had long been communicating through various channels with some members of the Confederacy, and trying to induce them to separate themselves from the rest, but he had as yet made no overture tending to a general pacification for he knew that there could be no general pacification unless he was prepared to abandon the cause of James, and to acknowledge the Prince and Princess of Orange as King and Queen of England. This was in truth the point on which everything turned. What should be done with those great fortresses which Louis had unjustly seized and annexed to his empire in time of peace, Luxembourg which overawed the Moselle, and Strasbourg which domineered over the Upper Rhine? What should be done with the places which he had recently won in open war? Philipsburg, Mons, and Namur, Huy and Charleroi. What barrier should be given to the states general? On what terms Lorraine should be restored to its hereditary dukes? These were assuredly not unimportant questions. But the all-important question was whether England was to be, as she had been under James, a dependency of France, or, as she was under William and Mary, a power of the first rank. If Louis really wished for peace, he must bring himself to recognize the sovereigns whom he had so often designated as usurpers. Could he bring himself to recognize them? His superstition, his pride, his regard for the unhappy exiles who were pining at St. Germain's, his personal dislike of the indefatigable and unconquerable adversary who had been constantly crossing his path during twenty years, were on one side his interests and those of his people were on the other. 
he must have been sensible that it was not in his power to subjugate the English, that he must at last leave them to choose their government for themselves, and that what he must do at last it would be best to do soon. Yet he could not at once make up his mind to what was so disagreeable to him. He, however, opened a negotiation with the States General through the intervention of Sweden and Denmark, and sent a confidential emissary to confer in secret at Brussels with Dykvelt, who possessed the entire confidence of William. There was much discussion about matters of secondary importance, but the great question remained unsettled. The French agent used, in private conversation, expressions plainly implying that the government which he represented was prepared to recognize William and married, but no formal assurance could be obtained from him. Just at the same time the King of Denmark informed the Allies that he was endeavoring to prevail on France not to insist on the restoration of James as an indispensable condition of peace, but did not say that his endeavors had as yet been successful. Meanwhile Avaux, who was now ambassador at Stockholm, informed the King of Sweden that, as the dignity of all crowned heads had been outraged in the person of James, the most Christian king felt assured that not only neutral powers, but even the emperor, would try to find some expedient which might remove so grave a cause of quarrel. The expedient at which Avaux hinted doubtless was that James should waive his rights, and that the Prince of Wales should be sent to England, bred a Protestant, adopted by William and Mary, and declared their heir. To such an arrangement William would probably have had no personal objection, but we may be assured that he never would have consented to make it a condition of peace with France. Who should reign in England was a question to be decided by England alone. It might well be suspected that a negotiation conducted in this manner was merely meant to divide the Confederates. William understood the whole importance of the conjuncture. He had not, it may be, the eye of a great captain for all the turns of a battle but he had, in the highest perfection, the eye of a great statesman for all the turns of a war. That France had at length made overtures to him was a sufficient proof that she felt herself spent and sinking. That those overtures were made with extreme reluctance and hesitation proved that she had not yet come to a temper in which it was possible to have peace with her on fair terms. He saw that the enemy was beginning to give ground, and that this was the time to assume the offensive to push forward, to bring up every reserve, but whether the opportunity should be seized or lost it did not belong to him to decide. The King of France might levy troops and exact taxes without any limit save that which the laws of nature impose on despotism, but the King of England could do nothing without the support of the House of Commons, and the House of Commons, though it had hitherto supported him zealously and liberally, was not a body on which he could rely. It had indeed got into a state which perplexed and alarmed all the most sagacious politicians of that age. There was something appalling in the union of such boundless power and such boundless caprice. The fate of the whole civilized world depended on the votes of the representatives of the English people, and there was no public man who could venture to say with confidence what those representatives might not be induced to vote within twenty-four hours. William painfully felt that it was scarcely possible for a prince dependent on an assembly so violent at one time, so languid at another, to effect anything great. Indeed, though no sovereign did so much to secure and to extend the power of the House of Commons, no sovereign loved the House of Commons less. Nor is this strange, for he saw that house at the very worst. He saw it when it had just acquired the power and had not yet acquired the gravity of a senate. In his letters to Heinzius, he perpetually complains of the endless talking, the factious squabbling, the inconstancy, the dilatoriness of the body which his situation made it necessary for him to treat with deference. His complaints were by no means unfounded, but he had not discovered either the cause or the cure of the evil. End of section 5